Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us tonight here in the room. And I know we have a lot more people watching us via Zoom which is great. Uh, we love to have you here, but we welcome you from home too. So I think we're gonna have a very uh, fun and interesting program tonight. Um, before we get started, uh, for those of you who are here, uh, there are some books over here that relate to uh, Great Britain. And so you could check them out and take them home if anything piques your interest. Plus there's plenty more downstairs. Don't worry, we have more books. Um, I just wanted to let you know a few things coming up. This Sunday is our Arts Live concert at 2 p.m. We're having uh, Steve Justman, who does a Listen and Learn concert, meaning he, he mostly sings, but he does give us some background on the, um, the artists and the, the music. And that, so it's, it's always uh, great to hear the music, but I like hearing some of the stuff, <laughs> the background stuff, it interests me. Hmm, sorry. So uh, one more note, we have, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, that is a hybrid. You can come in person, or if you can't make it here, you can watch it from home just like tonight. But next Tuesday, we have a program that is strictly virtual, so you'll have to watch it via Zoom. It's called Classic Monster Mash, and we're going to be seeing clips and hearing about classic Hollywood horror movies from the 30s and 40s. We're going to learn different things like how lighting and makeup and costumes affect that experience, and we're going to learn how kids celebrated Halloween 100 years ago. So um, if you want a fun Halloween evening, try to try to tune in to Zoom for that. Don't come here, we won't be. The, the, the speaker is in North Carolina, so he won't be here. Um, okay, now tonight, tonight we're gonna have, like I said, a very fun and interesting program. John Gowing is with us. I would say straight from Great Britain, but no, he's been here a few years, but he's going to, uh, he has that lovely British accent we all love though. So we're gonna hear all this information with, with the actual British accent. Um, there are a lot of things we probably wondered about, Great Britain, the British Isles, the United Kingdom. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things he's gonna talk about. He seems to have a lot of names and maybe what they all mean. Um, and I think he might have some information too about 
the queen, unfortunately, we all know that she passed away not that long ago. So um, we'll probably be hearing about her. So please welcome Mr. John Gowan. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. So I hope the volume's not too loud for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you for everybody at home who's uh, who's tuned in. Now, because this is a hybrid, I might stand in the wrong place for the people at home. So I'm hoping that uh, you will flag up something with the great IT guy we've got tonight. You guys will see me wherever I go. So so that's cool. Just briefly a little bit about what I'm I'm doing here. Um, I was a, a teacher in the state system in the in the UK. That's what you call public schools in the US. Public schools in England are the private sector. So it's it's easy, isn't it? <laughs> so I was a teacher for 32 years, and then I decided that um, that I'd had enough. Not with the students. It's in their job description to be pains in the butt. Um, but with the fact that I was a head of department, I was trying to manage a budget and dwindling resources and government interference, and it was time to do something else. So uh, I became um, what is known as a blue badge tour guide. Now, the blue badge is um, what's in the, oh, I beg your pardon, is what's in the middle of the uh, slide there. Um, it's the, the flagship guiding program in the UK. And uh, there is actually a badge, you'd call it a, a pin in the States. Uh, it's in the safe at home because it's the most valuable piece of jewelry I own. Uh, it probably cost about $15,000 to get because it was a two year program to train. And I was very lucky because I was a head of department in, again, what you would call a community college. And I could organize my schedule to go up to London two nights a week to do the training. Long story short, I quit teaching in 2008, became a full-time tour guide. And then um, in 2014, I was asked to guide uh, a group of people from this area, about 50 of them, who were all big Downton Abbey fans. Downton Abbey? And uh, normally when I guide, I meet the group in the morning, they've all had their breakfast, I jump on a coach with them, we go around and do whatever it is, and then I say goodbye to them, and then I go and have a beer and think, oh, I've got the next day, what am I going to do? Um, but they were a group of VIPs, and so the tour company said, will you stay in the hotel with the group? Long story short, there was a lady traveling on her own. She was very pleasant. We often found ourselves together in the bar when most people had gone to bed, just chatting. No, you see, no, 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 no. That's far too professional for that. Um, but at the end of the week, when she, uh, prior to flying back, she said, um, you know, please stay in touch. So I thought, oh, yeah, okay. So I sent her an email saying, hope you had a great time. Uh, it was lovely to meet you all, blah, blah, blah. Um, P.S., under different circumstances, maybe. And she uh, emailed back and said she felt the same. So we fell in love on Skype before we even, even held hands. So pretty cool. And um, she is a, a dentist and she wanted to carry on working. And as a blue badge guide, I could still um, get my British pensions and so on. So I thought, well, I'll come here. And when I came here, I thought, well, brain the size of a planet, all things British. How do I stop getting stale? And I went into the local library and said, hey, here I am. I'm a Brit. I know a little bit about stuff. Um, how about it? And we went from there. So that's why I'm, I'm here tonight. So thank you for, for coming out for this. Now, it's not all things British or we'd be here forever. Uh, this, is kind of, this is kind of some things British. And it's based a lot on the general questions I got asked when I was guiding groups in the UK. They were mostly Americans, obviously New Zealand, Australia. I can't guide in another language. Uh, excuse me. So it was sort of, you know, English speaking. And um, these questions came up all the time. So I hope that um, the presentation will answer some questions. Um, if you have a question, if you want to leave it to the end so we can have a sort of proper discussion and, and so I don't answer it later on. Is that all right? Perfect. Well, let's see if I can uh, move this on. So there is our national flag and uh, its proper name is the Union Flag. It's not the Union Jack. OK, everybody calls it the Union Jack, and it's it's one of these things that gets misused so often that people accept it and it's not worth arguing about. But it's the Union flag. It's only the Union Jack when it's on a ship because the flagpole on the ship is called a Jack Staff. So when it goes on the ship, OK, so look at that, you've had your money's worth already. I know you didn't pay anything, did you? Oh, dear. <laughs> OK, so what is it actually the Union of? Well. 
If you look at the uh, at the at the top there, we've got the um, red cross on a white background. That's the flag of England, and then we have the blue background, white diagonals. That's the it's called the saltire. That's the national flag of Scotland. And when King James the first came to the throne on the death of Queen Elizabeth the first in 1603, there was the Stuart because he was already King James the sixth of Scotland, but he became James the first of England. So that was a sort of um, the beginning of a, of a unity. It wasn't official, but he put the red flag of England over the top of the Scottish flag. And so during the Revolutionary Wars. Um, that time where we in Great Britain thought that you in the colonies were ready to take your place on the world stage, and we withdrew graciously to allow you to develop. Well, oh, another group of people that think a whole load of guys with dead raccoons on their head beat the finest army in the world. You know, Americans don't like to be patronized, so we had to make it look good. We wore red jackets and we stood in straight lines with shooting written on them, and you still nearly screwed it up. But that's the flag that you would have seen um, during the Revolutionary War, this one here. You see? You have the rod on the Scottish. And that was pretty much formalized in the early 1700s with the Act of Union. Queen Anne was on the throne, and Scotland and England were officially kind of put together into Great Britain. Okay, and then in the 1820s, Ireland came on board, and so the uh, cross of Patrick, which is there, the red diagonal on a white background, was added to the Union flag. So it's actually the Union of England, Scotland, and Ireland. A lot of people say, well, what about Wales? Isn't Wales in there somewhere? Well, Wales and England have been joined together, you know, long, many centuries before that. So that's what it's the, the union of. And if you look at the next slide, there is a correct way to fly the union flag. There is an upside down, believe it or not. Now, obviously, if you fly the stars and stripes upside down, it's pretty obvious, but not so obvious with the union flag. Now, the reason for that was that the cross of St. Patrick, the red diagonal, was added much later than the Scottish. And so to make sure that it was clear that Scotland had seniority, they offset the red diagonals. So can you see how um, that doesn't continue down there, it jumps to there, and that doesn't continue down there, it jumps to there. So it was offset. So the correct way to fly the Union flag is always to have the thick white bar there indicated by the yellow arrow for those of you at home that may not see that little red light. Uh, it must be flown that way. Let me show you what it looks like upside down. See the difference? See it's the skinny line? Okay. And um, the reason that you would fly the flag upside down is one of two. First of all, it's ignorance. <laughs> you don't know. The second thing is that it was a very makeshift SOS sign. And during the Second World War, when the Nazis invaded the British Channel Islands, which are nearer the coast of France than the UK, the Channel, uh, Channel Islanders turned all their Union flags upside down as a kind of middle finger to the Nazis. I mean, obviously Winston Churchill and the British government knew they'd been invaded, but until the Germans took them down and replaced them with their, well, not, they weren't decent German people, the Nazis, they took the flags down and replaced them with their swastikas. So it was their little bit of resistance, if you like. Um, when I meet groups in London, I often meet them outside their hotel, and it's just my thing. I look around and I see Union flags, and yep, 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 yep. But very occasionally I get to a hotel or a small place, and the flag's upside down. So I go in and I speak to the person behind the reception, who's probably Lithuanian and doesn't care. Uh, <laughs> their flag is upside down. And they say, oh, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. And it's still upside down the next time I go. So there is an example of one upside down. and. Uh, Here's another one. This, this guy is a, a racist, you know, keep Britain for British people. Uh, and he's so proud of his country that he can't even get his national flag up the correct way. So, <laughs> so just for a bit of, uh, a bit of fun. 
Okay, now another flag you see is the, the royal standard. So um, when the, the late queen was alive, any palace that she was in would fly the royal standard over the top. And now that we have King Charles, more about him later, the same will apply. Now the royal standard is uh, in four quarters, as you can see. Two of them are the same, the top left and the bottom right. Those are the three lions of England. The lion was adopted as the symbol of England by King Richard I, Richard the Lionheart. Have you heard of him? Okay, he was probably the worst king we ever had after my namesake, King John, and that was his brother. Um, he was king for 10 years, from 1189 to 1199. He was only in the country three months of that 10 years, and he only spoke French. So he wasn't much use to us, but he was a brave soldier, and uh, he adopted the lion. And then when he was killed besieging a castle in 1199, his younger brother John became king, and he confirmed. And we all know about John. He was the one dragged kicking and screaming into a field near Windsor called Runnymede to put his seal to Magna Carta, the great uh, first bill of human rights, if you like. I think six clauses of it are still effective in the American Constitution, uh, but I would stand corrected. Um, the top right is the lion rampant of Scotland, and that was King James I's um, emblem, if you like. And um, when James became king on the death of Queen Elizabeth I, he travelled down to London and obviously, you know, couldn't get on a, a postman train. It took time coming down. And a lot of the inns and pubs and things that he stayed at on the way down to his coronation at Westminster Abbey, they changed their name in honour of him. And that's why the Red Lion is the most common pub name in, 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 in England. And the bottom left, you can see the, um, the heart there of, of, of Ireland. So there, that completes our, our union, if you like. And you see the harp, not the shamrock, the harp on the tail fin of, um, is it Ryanair? Is the budget airline, um, the Irish airline? So that's the, um, that's the and um, there it is flying over Buckingham Palace. Now, a question I got asked, particularly by people who've been to London maybe 20, 30 years ago, more than that now, um, they would see the Union flag on Buckingham Palace and they'd say, oh, the Queen's at home, right? And they would have been right prior to a major event that, that happened, the, um, the accident that uh, Princess Diana had. Because up until 1997, if the Queen was in Buckingham Palace, the Union flag would be flying. And if she wasn't there, there was no flag. Now, when Diana was killed, her Majesty was up in Scotland with the, the boys, William and Harry, and there was no flag on Buckingham Palace to lower to half mast, we call it in England, but half staff for you guys. And the British people were quite angry about this, so the system was changed. So there is always a flag flying over Buckingham Palace now, the Union flag when the monarch is not there, and the Royal Standard when um, he is now King Charles III will, will be. And interestingly, I always used to say to my groups, um, if after a great day of guiding, I go home and I lose my concentration because I've given my all to the group and I step in front of a truck and get killed, I need to do it on a day where the Union flag is flying because they will lower that to the best blue guide in Great Britain. Don't do it when the Sovereign is at home because the Royal Standard is never lowered to half star ever. Um, not even on the death of Her Majesty was it lowered because we are never without a monarch. The last breath of the previous one is the first breath of the new one. The queen is dead, long live the king. So the, the um, royal stand always stays at the top. Now, that's the common question. What's the difference between the United Kingdom and the British Isles? Well, quick masterclass and you will never forget. Nice and easy. First of all, Great Britain is everything that's joined together. So you can see there um, England, Wales and Scotland. That is Great Britain. Okay. Now you'll see over here Northern Ireland. Now the, the Brits ran Ireland until it was given its independence in the 1920s, but the British kept six counties in the north. And um, that is like a political alliance. So that is the United Kingdom. 
Okay, so you have Great Britain and Northern Ireland is the United Kingdom. And um, this from space is the geographical area that's known as the British Isles. And that includes the whole island of Ireland there as well. So that's geographical. Okay, so Great Britain joined together, United Kingdom political with Northern Ireland and the British Isles. Now, the problem with Brexit, <laughs> you know, wanting to leave the European Union, um, is caused as a result that the United uh, Kingdom, the Northern Ireland part, had a 310 mile border with a country that was still in the EU. And the EU wanted to ensure that the, you know, the trading that went on between the two followed their rules and, and so on. And it became a, a nightmare. So leaving was fairly easy. Getting all of this set up has, has proved quite, uh, quite difficult. So um, that's where we are with, uh, with, the, with the EU. Now, obviously, the, the, the big news, I mean, obviously, I wasn't asked about this while I was, was guiding, but I tried to sort of update it for questions that you might be interested in. The passing of um, Her Majesty, uh, the longest serving British monarch, um, and sadly, sadly missed. And um, this was her lying in state. I mean, she died at Balmoral, the uh, Scottish castle that the, the royal family actually owns. And um, she was brought from Balmoral down to uh, London. And she was uh, uh, put on a, a plinth here in the Great Hall at Westminster. We'll, we'll work out where that is a little later in the presentation. And then her um, uh, a couple of sons there, I think, and they all took turns to stand there and stand guard over there. Um, and something like people filed past um, while Her Majesty was uh, was lying there, and uh, the queue apparently was the longest. You had to wait something like eleven hours, and uh, they were getting people as, through as quickly as they as they as they possibly could. Um, these were the uh, pool bearers. And you'll see that they're, they're all the guards that you see standing on duty outside Buckingham Palace. Uh, there were eight of them, and they did the, the, the whole thing. Uh, from the Queen's body coming from Balmoral to London, she was put on a, a Royal Air Force transport. Now, apparently, the story is that when Diana was killed in Paris, they had difficulty loading her coffin onto the, the Royal Jet, specifically on standby if a monarch or anybody of significance dies dies abroad. And it would have been like almost impossible to adapt it. And the Queen was fully involved in her funeral service. She suggested all of the, the things um, that we that we saw. And uh, apparently somebody from the RAF went to see her to say that um, if you're out of the country, this this jet isn't really suitable and she said you know kind of what have, what have you got and they said well we've got like the c-17 hercules and some other great big aircraft and the, the raf guy was expecting her to sort of launch and she said and i'm pretty much quoting she said isn't the c-17 what our soldiers have brought back from afghanistan in and he said, yes, ma'am. And she said, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So that these guys um, carried her coffin from Holmes to the hall, from the hall to Westminster and, and so on. The youngest of them was 19. And they are all Grenadine guards. Uh, you may not know this, but when you see the guys in their jackets and their bare skin caps and whatever, they all look the same, don't they? But there's actually five distinct regiments and a very quick way that you can tell them apart is if you can see their collars and you can see their buttons. Now, the five, we can't do a masterclass on guards now, but very easily, if you wanted to remember, all you have to remember is goldfish can swim in water. Nice and easy, right? Goldfish, grenadier, can, cold stream, swim, Scots in Irish water, Welsh. And their buttons go in that order. So these are Grenadier Guards. Can you see how their buttons are all in a single line? 
If they were Coldstream Guards, they'd be in twos. If they were um, Scots Guards, they'd be in groups of three. If they were Irish, two groups of four, and Welsh, two groups of five. So that's the first sign. The second sign is, if you look on their collars, you can see there that's a grenade. Um, doesn't look like it from this distance that you're, you're sitting or at home. But they have a grenade on their, 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 their collar. And these soldiers were chosen with the uh, commanding officer there. And that coffin uh, weighed just shy of 500 pounds. So Her Majesty was quite diminutive, but it was lead-lined and there was other things. You know, 500 pounds, and you've got the eyes of the rare on you. Right. So there's been a big call for them to be... Um, maybe given OBEs or honoured in some, in some way. And the funeral service was held at St George's Chapel out at Windsor. Um, a number of monarchs are, are buried out there. Henry VIII's out there, Charles I um, and Edward IV and so on. And there was a little section built to put the marker in for King George VI, the Queen's father, and then um, among when she passed in 2002, and now they've added uh, Elizabeth and, and Philip to. And of course, this was um, all preceded by the, the death of the Duke of Edinburgh uh, in 2021, and uh, his funeral was at Windsor Castle, and uh, his body was brought down from up the hill there and down into the down into the chapel. So we now have King Charles III, and uh, you could almost knock me down with a feather when he took the name Charles, because in the years that I was guiding, myself and most other guides that I know, we were led to believe that he wasn't going to pick the name Charles. And the reason he wasn't going to pick Charles was we've had two previous ones. One of them was beheaded. We're going to talk about him at some point. And the second one um, had something like 27 children, but none of them, none of them with his wife. And so we were led to believe that His Majesty thought that Charles possibly wasn't a good look, but he has chosen, uh, chosen Charles. Um, he was the longest heir apparent in British history. He waited for the longest job application in British history. Um, but now he's the, uh, now he's the king. And uh, he's 73. Then we have uh, Princess Anne. And uh, a lot of people used to see Princess Anne as a little bit kind of standoffish and snooty, but she's a very hardworking royal. And uh, I had the pleasure to, to meet her once briefly. And uh, she was absolutely charming. You know, there was no hint of I don't want to be here or whatever. And uh, um, she, she's a, a very nice lady, and she accompanied her mother's coffin all the way down from, from, from Scotland. And you can see her various medals, because most of the royals are the sort of commanders or the colonels of various regiments. Of course, the Sophie is the commander-in-chief, um, but she is a, a, a knight of the Order of the Garter. There's the, uh, the badge there, the oldest order of chivalry in the world. And she walked behind the, the coffin. A lot of the commentators were saying, well, why am I going to be walking behind? Well, in fact, she was in the mirror, and she had super working shoes. You know, you could see Kate, she had black high heels on and, and what have you. So, you know, it's com com common sense, really. Uh, then we have him, um, the, the Duke of York, Prince uh, Andrew. We, 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 we know the mess that he's in and the attachments that he's, that he's made. It's, it's not for me to comment. Um, and um, he's officially the Duke of York, which is, the, generally speaking, what the second son of the monarch is. The first is generally the Prince of Wales. So you might remember that one of Charles's first duties was to relinquish being the Prince of Wales, and he handed it over to, to William and Kate. Now, a question I get is, why are they the Prince of Wales? Um, where does that come from? Well, it, it actually dates back to King Edward I. Now, Edward I, in case you're not tremendously au fait with British history, he was the man that killed Mel Gibson. So if you've seen the movie Braveheart, <laughs> that was Edward I. Now, Edward I hated the Scots. He was known as the Hammer of the Scots. But he hated the Welsh equally. And the story is that um, he'd kind of given them a, a, a good kicking. And then he called all the chieftains together 
And, you know, in the language of today, he pretty much said, look, I've given you all a good kicking. I, I kind of want peace in Wales. I'll tell you what, I will give you your own prince that doesn't speak a word of English. And they're like, great, you know, who is this? And he went into the next room of his tent and he brought in his six week old baby son who didn't speak a word of anything. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a nice, it's a nice story. There's a lot more history to it, but that's fundamentally it. And then we have um, Edward and Sophie, and apparently um, the Queen had a real soft spot for Sophie. They got on really, really well. They used to research um, military history together, and Sophie lost her mother a while, a while ago, and she kind of looked on the Queen as her surrogate mum. And so uh, we got the Earl and the uh, the, the, the Countess of, um, of Wessex. Now, I do get asked why the female of a, an earl is a countess. Why, why is it not an earless? Well, the word earl comes from Scandinavian, a jarl. And, you know, we had the Danes and the Vikings and all sorts in, 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 in England. Um, and uh, I'm, I always get embarrassed when I, I have to explain this because I, I, I need to know, I need to let them know that I know. But the explanation is that the um, Earl came over pretty much with William the Conqueror in 1066. Um, they had counts in France, but the word count sounds like a very, very disgusting Anglo-Saxon word. <laughs> and so they decided they couldn't possibly have counts because it sounds like a word we shouldn't mention. So that's the, uh, absolute, honestly the truth. Um, so we have Charles and Diana uh, obviously getting married and then they had uh, William and Harry. And uh, then sadly, we know what happened um, on August 31st, 1997 in an underpass in Paris, uh, there was a car crash and uh, sadly she was, uh, she was killed. And her funeral was held in Sir Abbey, but then her body was put in a hearse and taken to the family home. Um, it's written all for, and most people pronounce it like that, but I have heard people call it Altrop, and she was buried on an island um, in, the, in the lake, so it didn't become a sort of Diana shrine, if you like. Um, then William married Kate, very, very happy day, and uh, what happens when a lady marries the heir to the throne? Her first duty is to produce an heir, and uh, more than likely a spare as well, and so she did very well. She produced an heir, a spare, and a spare. <laughs> and, um, you know, interestingly, uh, uh, interestingly, a spare isn't as important now, but hundreds of years ago, when we were fighting the Scots, we were fighting the French, whatever, the, the, the son of the monarch, usually the king, would often lead the army into battle on behalf of his father and could get killed. And, um, if you think about you know Richard the Lionheart becoming king, I mean he had three brothers, and uh, uh, one died, uh, one was killed. John died in twelve fifty. They, you know, they all pretty much um, did their bit. But here we have, um, and we have George up there, and then um, Charlotte and and Louis. Now, when Kate was pregnant with George, there was a meeting of all the Commonwealth countries to debate whether or not that if Kate had a daughter that she would become queen because you know traditionally it was the, the male and of course thank goodness they did away with that completely antiquated way of things and some of our greatest monarchs have been women um, and so it wouldn't have mattered if, if Charlotte had been born first she would have been, been queen um, and just before the queen's passing for a um, first time in about 130 years. We actually had three descendant heirs to the throne alive at the same time. We had Charles and William and we had um, George here. Uh, and then we had this happen and Harry met um, Meghan, whirlwind, uh, whirlwind romance. Um, you know, I, I kind of don't want to get my news from any form of media now, so it's not for me to comment. You know, at the end of the day, they 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 were happy, um, and they got married at Windsor Castle, uh, an absolutely joyous day. Um, so when I actually hear her from her own lips saying things like "the British people didn't like me" to Oprah, 
Um, and then on that day, they were 12 deep in Windsor Great Park while she was in the carriage going past and, and whatever. It's um, like Her Majesty said, uh, recollections may differ, which was fantastic for the Queen to, to say that. Um, then they um, had Archie, not short for Archibald, Archie in its own right, comes from a Scottish meaning brave. And then um, second name Harrison, which I thought was quite clever, Harry's son. And then uh, Mountbatten, which was a, a, a family name, um, originally because of the connection to the German royal family through Queen Victoria marrying uh, her first cousin, Albert. Um, the, uh, the, the, the name was um, Battenberg, which was German for Batten Mountain. But because of the First World War with us fighting the Germans, then the British royal family thought this isn't great. So they changed it from Battenberg to Mount Batten and put it into English. The same way that um, the Queen's grandfather didn't think that Saxe Coburg Gotha was a good surname for the British royal family during the First World War. So he changed it to Windsor. So. Um, so then uh, they decided that they would walk away from um, royalty. Uh, you know, I can't begin to imagine what it was like for Harry as a young boy walking behind his mother's coffin, being in the spotlight. I can quite understand his hatred of the media. Um, you know, again, it's not for me to, to judge, but I think they're a very troubled couple. What I can't reconcile is the fact that they want to walk away from the royal family, but the only way that they can make money is their connection to it. So, you know, if she went flipping burgers in McDonald's and he worked in a car wash, I'd have some respect. But, you know, um, anyway, we'll move on. It's um, I, I, I wish them and the royal family well at resolving the, uh, the issue. Apparently, there's a book in abeyance at the moment that's going to come out in November that's going to be a, a, a sort of uh, a real trashing of the royal family. And I think if they did that, I think um, King Charles will remove their Duke and Duchess of Sussex titles. Um, so, And, you know, just to show that the, uh, the general feeling about William and Harry has changed somewhat, uh, this was a photograph taken at the Queen's funeral in Westminster Abbey. And first of all, you'll, you'll notice that um, Harry there is uh, not in any sort of uniform. Uh, he was banned from, from doing that, um, not out of spite, but the British royal family is very protocol driven. If you're not a current member of the working royal family, there are certain things you can't do. That was the condition. It wasn't that he'd run off and done whatever. That was the condition. Um, I thought it was a little sad because he did actually serve his country. He was out in Afghanistan with your brave boys and girls as well. So, you know, he, he was he was out there in it. And so he was allowed to wear his uniform when he stood on ceremonial duty around his mother's coffin, but certainly not at the, the abbey. Um, but the bit I... <laughs> The bit I like best is, um, you see where Megan is? Look where they put the candlestick. Look, well, they, well, the candlestick was there. That's where they sat her because this is where the, the camera angle was. So very, very little of her there. Um, so it was a bit of a, a bit of a snub. But like I say, I hope they, I hope they sort it out. Um, and there he is, you know, not uh, not being able to wear his uniform when he was walking behind the uh, the procession from. Um, uh, Westminster Abbey when she when she came out, well, no, going in actually she came out into the hearse and the hearse drove her to the uh, to to Windsor. Okay, so here is the uh, the current line of uh, succession now. So obviously we have King Charles the third, and then we've got William and his three children taking precedence. So every time they produced a child, Harry Harry was moved one further out. Um, so now we've got Harry, we've got Archie and uh, Lilibet. This is the first photograph I've actually seen of, 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 of her. Um, then we have Andrew and then his uh, two daughters, but uh, they're kind of both married now. So uh, that's her child and that's hers. So that's the, the dozen, if you like, in, in, in line. So just a couple of fond, fond memories of Her Majesty. Um, you know, people used to say that she always looked very miserable. Um, and I thought to myself, well, if you had to spend all day glad handing people and maybe not necessarily always wanting to be there and maybe being a bit tired, 
But um, always when she went to the races, she was completely at home. She loved horses, very accomplished horsewoman, was was riding right up until the last couple of years of her, her life. And um, she would go to the races, and if one of her horses was was running, you know, um, she'd be very, very excited. Uh, Charles has no interest in horse racing, so I think he's already um, sold off his, his mum's horses, or they're up for sale, let's put it like that. Um, remember in 2012, London got the Olympic Games, the first, the first city in the world to get it on three occasions. Um, first time we got it in 1908. We weren't due to get it. It was due to go to uh, Rome. But Mount Vesuvius had uh, erupted and the Italian authorities wanted to spend money on repairs, not on Olympic Games. And so we said, we'll, we'll, we'll have it. It was a much smaller affair there. Um, they actually incorporated it into an exhibition with the French at a place in London called the White City. So that was, that was there. Uh, then we got it in 1948. And uh, people thought, again, that we got it because with your help and my opportunity to say thank you, otherwise this presentation would have been in German tonight, um, that it was a reward for us getting the, you know, winning the war. Uh, it wasn't. London was on the, was on the, the list to be there in 48. Um, and then 2012. And if you remember the uh, opening ceremony, James Bond goes to Buckingham Palace. And when I saw the back of Her Majesty at her credenza or whatever the table was, I would have put my mortgage on it being a lookalike. I, I really would have. And when she turned around, you could have knocked me down with a feather that it was Her Majesty. And she looked like a little girl again. It was just, it was just great. And then, of course, she parachuted into the, um, <laughs> into the stadium. <laughs> Which was brilliantly done, and uh, and then she she came into the uh, into the stadium. Um, you may remember this for her seventieth um, jubilee, her platinum jubilee. The whole celebrations were kicked off by um, a very famous British character called Paddington Bear. You have Paddington Bear here, and um, he went for tea with the with the Queen. And he made a mess of it. He drank all the tea, he drank the tea out of the spout of the teapot. And then he offered Her Majesty a marmalade sandwich and he took his hat off and he said, you know, I keep it in my hat for emergencies. And Her Majesty was a great sport. She put her handbag on the table and she opened it and she said, I keep mine in here. And she pulled her, it was only a little skip before, you know, off it, off it went. Um, when people started leaving flowers and balloons and mementos and cards, at Buckingham Palace, they had to put out an appeal uh, to stop people leaving um, marmalade sandwiches because it was attracting pigeons and rats and God knows what. Um, but all the Paddington bears they collected have all gone to charity. And all the flowers that people brought, they were asked not to bring them wrapped in cellophane or paper. And they were all taken to Windsor and put along the, the big long walk, it's called. Um, to look like flower beds and then they were all mulched and you know recycled which which i thought her majesty would have been very pleased with um again don't want to offend anybody but you know they are human beings uh, i i like this there they are standing on the balcony a few years ago the duke of edinburgh still alive um they're out there and um the duke of edinburgh doesn't care so uh when I first came to America, I heard expressions that I'd never heard in the UK, one of which was cutting the cheese. I had no idea what that was, but now I do. And so this picture is the Duke of Edinburgh has just started to cut the cheese and Harry's just kind of heard the noise. The next picture, he's actually picked it up and, and the Duke of Edinburgh is just looking off, the Queen completely oblivious. And then they kind of get it at the bottom. Harry's lost it. And look at the look of disgust on Her Late Majesty's face. Um, you know, so uh, it just proves that they are, they are human. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's move on. Um, another question I get is about the Queen's uh, authority or the King's or the monarch's authority. I must say now, I'm still very difficult not to refer to Her Majesty. So the King's authority, and I say that the uh, the monarch reigns but doesn't rule. And the reason for that, a very quick story, uh, we go back to this guy, King Charles I. He was the son of James I, the first of the Stuarts. And um, when he came to the throne on the death of his father in 1625, he was actually a very arrogant man. I mean, his father was as well. He kind of you know, bred it into Charles that the king was God's representative on earth, could do no wrong. 
and you know he he actually believed this and that's how he was 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 ruling you know we had a parliament but it was the king's prerogative to call parliament and dissolve it at, at his whim and mostly parliament was there to just rubber stamp when the king needed money for wars or projects or whatever it happened to be anyway in the in the 1630s up in scotland they wanted to reorganize the church of scotland and they wanted to get rid of bishops and Charles told them no, because he was head of the church, you know, dating back to Henry VIII, break with, with Rome. And the Scots went ahead and did it anyway. So Charles summoned Parliament and he said, I need money to get an army together to go to Scotland to teach them a, a lesson that I'm the, the monarch. And Parliament actually refused him. They said no. And this was like unheard of. So Charles allegedly said, well, you know, why? And they said, well, the last time you summoned us for money for a project, you promised that you would acknowledge Parliament a little bit more in terms of the fact that, you know, we are elected, even though the, the elections were pretty corrupt then, you know, you had to be a landowner. It, you know, not everybody had the vote, but nevertheless, it was kind of democratic. Um, and you went back on your promise, so you're not having the money. And so he dissolved Parliament and he went north with as much of an army as he could cobble together from his you know, barons and earls and, and so on. And uh, he got his butt kicked by the Scots who chased him back into England. So he came down to London again and he called Parliament and he said, the Scots are in the north of England. I need the money to get the army to drive them out. And again, Parliament said, well, that's your lookout. You know, we've got no problem with the Scots. They're quite, quite nice people. Um, it's, it's your problem. And Charles was so angry that he uh, he sent soldiers to Parliament to arrest the people that he thought were the ringleaders, five of them. And uh, prominent amongst them was Oliver Cromwell, who was a member of Parliament for a, a place near Cambridge. Now, they heard the soldiers were coming and they managed to get out of the Houses of Parliament. And Charles was so angry, he um, dissolved Parliament and he pretty much declared war on it. So he, he moved the royal court to Oxford and the parliamentarian army stayed around London. And the reason they did that was that the merchants um, in the city of London that made all the money were so fed up being taxed by the king independently, they thought they'd throw their lot in with parliament. And we had the English Civil War. And this is a reenactment, of course, you know, we didn't have colour photography then, but just just like you have your reenactments of the of the Civil War, uh, we have civil um, English Civil War reenactments and um, the, the battle is reenacted. And up until about six, uh, 1642 or so, the battles were very small scale. If you'd come over to America to watch a battle, you'd have had to have asked, you know, which way to go. Um, but it got serious after then because Charles decided to bring back soldiers from Ireland who'd been used to brutalizing the Irish, so very cruel people. And Oliver Cromwell said, look, we can't just keep turning up with these farm boys and, and, and fight. We need to train them. So he got his general, a man called Thomas Fairfax, to, to train them, and they became known as the New Model Army. And the battles got much more bloody. In fact, per head of the population um, that existed during the time, uh, more people were killed in the English Civil War than in the First World War. And we lost a million men in the First World War. So obviously we didn't lose a million here, but as a percentage of the population as a, as a whole. Now, here's a, a list of some of the more famous battles. There were various sieges and, and one thing and another. But the final battle was fought at a place called Naseby. You see it there. Uh, in 1645, Parliament won. The king was... Uh, sort of pretty much taken into to custody. But he was told, look, you know, Parliament have won now. We still want you as a king. We're still mindful that, you know, you are anointed by God and so on. But you have to acknowledge the authority of Parliament, which he said he would do. He, he didn't really have much choice at that stage. But then behind the back of Parliament, what he tried to do was to get an army from um, Ireland and France um, to come and fight Catholics because his wife was a Catholic. And Parliament got to hear about this before it could happen. And Charles was arrested 
and he was put on trial for his his life at Westminster Hall, the same hall, same building that Her Majesty was lying in state in. And um, he was found guilty of, of treason against the English people. And all through the trial, he was completely arrogant. He was playing with his hat. He played with his gloves. He wouldn't answer questions. And he said, I, you know, I acknowledge the, uh, the power of parliament, but not its authority. Anyway, the judge and the jury got so fed up, he was, he was sentenced to death. And so on January the 30th, 1649, um, he was beheaded. And uh, he was beheaded outside the banqueting house. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like today, but it's in Whitehall, just up from the Great Hall. And um, if on a rainy day when you've got nothing else to do, you want to find a movie that's really good about uh, about all this, there's a movie called Cromwell, a very famous actor called Richard Harris plays Oliver Cromwell. Alec Guinness, who's fantastic, um, or was fantastic, Obi-Wan Kenobi to youngsters. But uh, um, there, there's a movie called Cromwell, and this is the scene where he's on his way to his execution. And... Um, this is an old lithograph or a print of whatever of him being beheaded outside the, the banqueting house. And this is actually the death warrant that was signed and sealed by all the people who, who had to. And I've had the real privilege of actually seeing it. It's stored in, in Parliament. And as a Blue Badge Guide, we got a special in. And, uh, you know, seeing this thing was just absolutely amazing. So that's what Banqueting House looks like today. It's in, in Whitehall. It's all that's left of the old Whitehall Palace that burned down in a fire in the late 1600s. So he was executed on a, um, a scaffold that was built uh, on, on what we would call the first floor there. So that's ground and that's first. So you start with first. You don't have a ground floor here. Often when I've had Americans in hotels, they don't know what to do. They see the lift buttons, you know, it's like, what's G? They think it's the garage, you know, which is understandable. You don't have it, you know, I'm not teasing. It's just, why would you know? Okay, so um, Oliver Cromwell then was installed as Lord Protector. Uh, he was offered the throne, but he rejected it. He said it was corrupt, but he still did pretty much act like a king for 11 years. And it was a horrible time. Um, they were very Puritan. They were uh, children weren't allowed to play on the streets. Christmas was cancelled. The theatres were closed. So it was pretty. It was pretty draconian. And so when he died um, in 1658, well, just before he died, obviously he nominated his son as his successor. And Richard Cromwell was a bit of a waste of space by all accounts. Uh, he hadn't distinguished himself particularly in the Civil War. He had no high office, but he was Cromwell's son. And he inherited a country, um, something like $4 million in debt in 1658. So imagine. Um, and the army and parliament, who'd been great allies in fighting Charles, were now at each other's throats. The army said they hadn't been paid. Parliament were uh, worried about there being an insurrection, the army overthrowing them. And it was really difficult. And uh, Richard was given the job of sorting it out. Now, you know, sometimes if someone is given the job as an honest broker and they don't make progress, both sides turn on them. Well, that's exactly what happened to Richard. And he got the nickname Tumble Down Dick. Queen Dick and Hickory Dick. And it's where the children's nursery rhyme Hickory Dickory Dock comes from. Uh, the mouse, because he was ineffectual, ran up the clock, the seat of power. He was only in power for a year. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down, Hickory Dickory Dock. So if I'm lucky enough to be invited back by Janet and her staff to do my dark history of nursery rhymes, you'll, you'll get the story. Um, so he resigned after a year and the um, parliament sent a deputation over to France to ask the son of the beheaded king, also called Charles, who'd been in exile in France with his mother, to come over and um, become king, but with much restricted power. So that was the start of the monarch reigning and not ruling, if that makes, makes sense. So over came Charles II, okay? And um, the guy that I mentioned earlier, you know, that had 27 children and none of them with his wife, he had 16 known mistresses. Uh, there was a good chance he had more than 27. Those are the official ones. And, um, you know, interestingly, over history, even much before this, even Henry VIII's time, if the king sired a child out of out of wedlock, when it was quite clear it was his, like the, the the boy got to be about four or five years of age and looked like him. The king would often acknowledge them and give them a title or, you know, give them at least some living. And that's when their birth certificate would be filled in. And where it said father, 
they would write in in French, Fils de Roy, son of the king, those in French. And that's where the surname Fitzroy comes from. So if you know anyone called Fitzroy, somewhere down the line a few hundred years ago, someone, you know, was doing something maybe that he possibly shouldn't have. Um, and if you're into dogs at all, you know about the King Charles Spaniel, then name for him, because you look at the way his hair comes down on either side. So that's what um, that's where the King Charles Spaniel's got the name. Now, if on our tour we were going to go into Westminster Abbey, um, I show people this plaque that's on the floor, and you know, people are not stupid, but I had one lovely American lady, big smile on her face. She said, You told us he ruled the country. He was only three, you know, but she was she was laughing. And I said, No, absolutely. I said the story was that he was buried in Westminster Abbey with a full state funeral. And he lay there for three years. But when Charles II was restored, he went after everybody that had signed his father's death warrant, either alive or dead. And Cromwell's body was exhumed, was put on trial. I think he reserved the right to remain silent. Um, and they hacked his head from his body and they threw the body into a, a sort of common pit. And his head was outside Parliament on a stick for 25 years as a kind of, this is what happens to anybody that messes with the monarch. So he was only in that place for three years, quite clearly. Um, okay, now you all know about the Great Fire of London of 1666. This isn't it. This is the fire of 1834 that burned down all the Parliament buildings, except one, which was the Great, the great Hall. And um, when they cleared all the site of all the debris, it was decided to build uh, new Houses of Parliament. There was a competition held. Architects were told, you can design whatever you like, but it must be Victorian Gothic style. And this was the winner, a man called Charles Barry designed Parliament. Now, when the design was approved, there was no plan to have a clock tower, but they decided they would put one in. So a 318 foot tower went up and a 14 ton bell was cast in East London, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry that did the Liberty Bell. The bell was brought on a big cart with like 20 horses pulling it. They pulled it up into the into the tower. And um, when it was installed, the man who cast the bell looked at the mechanism that was going to strike the the, the 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 bell and he said it's too big and the man who designed the clock a man called ej dent said nonsense well anyway within a month the clock uh, the bell cracked so instead of bringing it all the way down and, and smelting it down or whatever and making a new one they drilled a metal plate onto the top of the crack to stop it spreading they turned the bell a quarter of a turn and they reduce the size of the clapper. And that's why today Big Ben has that very distinctive sound that you know the world over. Uh, it was supposed to be E. I'm not quite sure what it is now. Any musicians here would be able to tell me. And of course, you all know that Big Ben is not the clock. It's the bell that is Big Ben. The clock tower never had a name, um, but it was named in honor of Her Majesty for her um, diamond jubilee. So it's the Elizabeth Tower now. Um, so the, um, the, the, it's actually the bell that's big then. Now, very quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, I, I get asked about the, you know, the government of the country. And although this might be a little difficult to see, it's easy to explain. The whole of the United Kingdom, we know what that is now, don't we? Great Britain joined together and Northern Ireland is divided into 650 areas and every four years each one of these areas can send a representative to parliament that's why we have 650 mps that's called a general election when the whole country goes to vote in their area um the fat arrow there is pointing to the the, the the major cities okay so that's that's london liverpool manchester up there and the reason for that is that these areas are not the same geographic size, but they contain roughly the same number of voters between about 90 and 120,000. So if you live in the wilds of Scotland up there where the blue arrow is up there, it's quite a big area to get 90,000 people together, isn't it? But if you're in London with a population of 8.6 million, you're going to have lots and lots of areas with those voters in. So now most people 
belong to a political party. You know, so here you have Democrats and Republicans. I know there are libertarians, but fundamentally you've got the two parties. In the UK, we have Labour, which is pretty much the Democrats. We have Conservative, pretty much Republicans. We have the Liberal Democrats. Uh, we have the Green Party. And then we have members of Parliament from each of the uh, other nations. So we have Scottish MPs. Um, we have uh, MPs from Northern Ireland, and we have MPs from, from Wales. But anyway, 650. Now, after an election, the party, the political party that gets more areas, they're called constituencies, that's the posh word, but let's call them areas. The party that gets more areas than anybody else is asked to form the government. Yep. Okay. But what you really want to make sure is that the party gets more than half. Because if they get more than half, it doesn't matter if all the others gang up on them, they will still win votes. And they need more than one or two because MPs die, sadly, or get sick. They need a big majority. So today's government, the, um, the government, they have a majority of something like 96. So they're well in, okay? Um, each political party represents its own leader. So that's why, unlike the states where you vote for a president, we don't vote for a prime minister. We vote for the party and the party decides. That's why when Boris was driven out, Liz Truss was voted for by the MPs and then all the card carrying conservative members. I didn't get a say in it. So we don't vote for the prime minister. We vote for the party. All right. So this was the result of the, 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 the last general election. Blue is the conservative, red Labour, yellow Scotland. And very briefly, Scotland, because they got all their MPs, they didn't get any Labour or, or, or Conservatives or whatever, they want to stay in the European Union. And that's opened up a whole other can of worms. So I'm mindful of the time now because we have to be we have to be out. They all sit in the chamber there. The government on the left, as we're looking at it, the right of the speaker, uh, he's the, uh, the chairperson, if you like. And these are all the opposition MPs over on, on this side. Uh, over here and we have two chambers this is the house of lords but it's the house of commons that does all the legislation the lords is a kind of confirming body if you if you like more more about that another time i'm just mindful that we're getting stuck in and then just to finish on on london um london is a huge city it's over 609 square miles uh you've got what you call freeways, they're in blue, we call them motorways. So the circular one is called the M25. And so the greater London area is, is in the middle. I put that red mark there because that's, that's where my flat is, my apartment. Um, founded by the Romans. That's what um, their little trading post that they called Londinium looked like. Um, they could get out to the sea easily, which is off to the, oh, sorry. Uh, which is off to the right and um this is the medieval city of london you can see that uh, pretty much the roman camp was here it expanded west because uh, nobody wanted to live in the roman ruins because they thought they were haunted and uh, so not much going on on the south side but there's 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 london bridge okay and then that's what it looks like today so that's that's our hour, uh, everyone. So I, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. If you have questions, I'm sorry it was a little bit rapid at the end. I get carried away. There's about another 30 slides, you know. We'll, we'll do all things British too, if I'm lucky to be invited back. But it, it just remains to say, if you have questions, we'll, 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 we'll take them now. I can't be that perfect that there was, everything was answered. Come ladies first. Um, I just, uh, I mean, I know it was the, the fighting and it was, it was very bad. Is it peaceful now? Or is it in the 1960s because it was it was religious you had the catholics and the protestants the protestants in the minority uh, in the majority and it was very inflammatory depending on what side you you came from the protestants would have marches 
celebrating battles 300 years ago where Catholics were killed. And it, it's that level of, of, of hatred. A peace was brokered by an American senator, um, Senator George Mitchell, I think his name was. And because obviously the Irish Catholics depended on America for donations, a lot of American people donated money to the IRA, thinking in good faith that they were helping the cause, but they weren't. They were buying arms and bombs and, 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 and what have you. Um, and that all came out and, and, and um, Senator Mitchell pulled it all together. And in answer to the question, is it more peaceful now? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, as a little boy, I lay in bed and heard three bombs go off in London one night, you know, so I remember what it was like. But yes, it's much calmer now. I think there are little flashes, but generally speaking, it's, it's open for business and all, all of that is behind us. Thank you. Good question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, that was an interesting question, and in my opinion, um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure. Um, when I was younger, I used to think that, you know, why didn't, with all the money that it was costing to keep troops there, why didn't they offer all the Protestants in Northern Ireland a home in England, a job, and, and tell them that they had to come over, that fundamentally, uh, you know, Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland only exist because of British occupation. Um, I think it's too entrenched now. And I, quite frankly, I think the Southern Irish people are so intelligent that they wouldn't be bothered. You know, I remember my grandfather, because my grandfather and grandmother were born in Ireland. My mother's Irish. My grandfather used to say, oh, if they gave it back to us, we'd build a wall around it. <laughs> but an interesting question. I, I, I wouldn't think so. I wouldn't think so. So. Yes. Um, that's really interesting. Um, Oxford Shear got its name because the, the River Thames flows through there and they could get ox oxen across the ford. It was as simple as that. Things like Sussex, Middlesex, Wessex were to do with Saxons. So Wessex, the West Saxons, Sussex, the South Saxons, Essex, the East Saxons. Um, but there is actually a, a good YouTube video you can watch. How did English counties get their, get their names? And you can, uh, and you can delve into that all you, all you like. <laughs> um, the, the whole mixture of Anglo-Saxon language, Danish language, you know, um, and the, 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 the Saxons. Absolutely. And um, Americans always say Oxford Shire or like, you know, the source that you, find difficult to pronounce Worcestershire all right it's not shire we say sure so it's Worcestershire it, it kind of dies away and in England if you went in and asked for a bottle of Worcestershire sauce they, they it's just Worcester sauce so we don't call it Worcestershire it's Worcester all right so anyway little, little, thank you for the question yes ma'am funeral they often refer to the, the kingdom and, or whatever they would say the word, and then they'd say and Northern Ireland. Yes. So is that what you were? Like, yes, it's Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, they can they can refer to it as that, or or the United Kingdom. But I think out of respect, they will often say Great Britain and Northern Ireland to include Northern Ireland in people's consciousness, because not everybody in the UK knows what we know from tonight. So um, so yeah, and the kingdom. Is, refer, is is short for United Kingdom, but Great Britain and Northern Ireland is kind of its posh title. Yes, ma'am. Um, why is um, Southern Ireland and Northern Ireland, why are they two different countries, per se? Okay, um, the reason for that is that the English occupied all of Ireland, and they, right from before Cromwell's, Oliver Cromwell's time, um, but over time, they fought for their independence. I mean, the IRA were in existence fighting the English long before it became a political battle. And in the 1920s, there was a, um, a not, not a revolution exactly, but there was a really big push for Irish independence. And the British government was pretty much fed up with it, um, trying to manage a group of people. And and people's views, their morality was changing. It was, a, it was an occupation. So it was decided that um, Ireland would be given its independence, but the six of the, the Irish counties would remain under British control. And so pretty much anybody in Southern Ireland who wanted to still be organised by the Brits would go 
go north, but it was unlikely. You know, the the the, the Northern Irish tended to be a lot of Scots who could come across because it's only a short distance from Scotland to Northern Ireland. But thank you for the question. Yeah. Is there any governance to the Commonwealth countries from uh, London or from the Parliament? No, is there any governance to the Commonwealth countries? No, they're all, they're all totally independent. I mean, the Queen is head of, well, the King now, is, is head of state of about six of them. And some of them now, after the passing of Her Majesty, have now decided that they're going to look at whether they want to stay in the Commonwealth or, 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 or not. You know, it was a trading group and then it was like a family of, of countries, if you like, that were under British rule. Of course they were. You know, we went we went and raped and pillaged and, you know, depending on which history books you read, civilised them and gave them the railroads. You know, it, it's just, you know, it just, it just depends. You know, history is written by the winners, isn't it? Um, but maybe one or two countries would, you know, like to leave, but some of them like their, their, their links to the UK. Thank you. I think on that, one more, and then we've got, we've got to get out, because I think Janet will get in trouble. We've been out of the door, right? So I have to wait. Thank you, Jim, from um, London to Scotland. And could you quickly tell us, like, some of the climate uh, differences around London? Uh, well, Scotland's in the north, so it's it's a bit colder, a bit rainier. The, the, west, the west of um, the United Kingdom is wetter than the east side because the clouds often come in off the atlantic you know they have to get over the we haven't got great mountains like you have here but enough to force rainfall on the west side um to get from london to scotland on a train you're probably looking at about five hours five and a half um probably about a, a 10 hour drive maybe from london to glasgow maybe eight if you've got a fast car um the weather's pretty nice in uh, you know springtime the summer's quite warm uh it's um it's a, a myth that England gets loads of rain. You know, all these all these movies of, you know, Jack the Ripper in swirling fog and all the rest of it. London actually gets less rainfall per annum than Rome does. Uh, it's just they get it all on one afternoon, you know. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a nice climate. It's cold um, January, February, but it's mostly the wind. We don't have, we don't have um, brutal weather like you have here at all. I can't remember the last time it snowed at Christmas time. It's it, it's pretty mild. It's it's like the three bears porridge. You know, it's not too hot and it's not too cold. It's, it's just right. So it's maritime. It's because of the ocean. Yeah. And I've been. I was there in February, and the daffodils were coming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the UK um, is it's very difficult to predict the weather. Uh, here you can because you've got a massive what they call a fetch. You know, the land that the weather moves over. So if they say it's going to rain tomorrow at four, it pretty much does. But in the UK, you've got four air masses fighting it out. You've got polar air coming from the south, uh, from the north. You've got warm air coming up from Africa. You've got warmish, moist air coming off the Atlantic. And you've got um, cold uh, air coming off Europe from Russia. And they fight it out over the UK. So that's why, you know, you you take an umbrella and a pair of sunglasses. But I can't tell you what day to take them on. Anyway, on that note, we must we must do it out. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm just going to put one slide up. Um, there we are. So if you um, if you want to follow me on Facebook, I have a, um, a, a page. It's called A Very British Subject. I just post um, British facts, where expressions come from, what happened on this day in 17-something. Totally apolitical. If you post anything political, it'll get obliterated. Um, um, but if you have a question about any British history or whatever, and I also post my talks on there. My next talk is on the 24th of October, and it's Zoom. Uh, if you go to, um, I, I don't quite know how you pronounce it. Is it ELA Public Library or ELA, ELA Public Library? I'm doing Jack the Ripper. So that's not for the faint-hearted. Uh, Victorian London as to why you know Jack got away with it for so long and, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Anyway, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.